Welcome to the Small Business Tax Savings Podcast, your weekly dose of accounting and tax tips specific to small business owners. You will be on your way to growing your business and paying the least amount in taxes as legally possible. Here's your host, Mike Jezoshek, CPA. Hello and welcome back to another episode. Today we're continuing our little series here that we're doing on real estate. And today's topic is what is an active investor and real estate professional? Now we've been talking about this from the beginning that real estate is tricky and and, and typically going to be treated much different than your traditional business. And this is just one blog post and one podcast podcast episode that we're doing in an entire guide that we're putting together on real estate taxes. So if you have not checked out our other content around real estate taxes, do so now. You can visit our ultimate guide to real estate taxes by going to tax savings podcast dot com forward slash real estate. Now, last week we talked about real estate losses and some strategies to utilize passive losses. And if you have not checked that one out, do so now. But this week, We're going to be expanding on two of those strategies, which are an active investor and the real estate professional status. So let's sit first with the active real estate investor. What is an active real estate investor? If you actively participate in managing a rental property, you can utilize up to $25,000 in rental real estate losses to offset other income. That also includes ordinary income. Now, with that being said, there are some income limitations and requirements that you need to be aware of in order to be considered what they call an active participant. So let's start with the easy ones first. Let's talk about income limitations. If your adjusted gross income is under $100,000, you qualify for this requirement. As easy as that. Now, the deduction does start to phase out for income between $100,000 and and 150,000 and once your income is over $150,000, it is completely phased out. So that's the income limitation. You can qualify for this $25,000 in real estate losses that you can use to offset other income if you qualify if you have income under 100,000, if it's over 150, it phases out. This is no longer available to you. But the next piece is that you need to actively participate And and basically, this is actually a really easy test to beat. The participation does not need to be regular, continuous, or substantial involvement. It can be something as simple as making management decisions or hiring contractors to provide services on the property. So let's summarize that. If your income is below $100,000 and you actively participate in managing your rental, you can deduct up to $25,000 in real estate losses against other income, and that includes ordinary income. This is going to start to phase out when you have between the income of $100,000 and $150,000 and completely phase out once your income tops $150,000. You would first need to net this $25,000 against other passive income before using it against your ordinary income. And if you are married filing separately, this allowance is not available for you. Any losses that are unable to be used are carried forward. So let's say you have more than $25,000 in losses, that is carried forward. Basically, if your income is under $100,000, you should be shooting for being an active real estate investor because it is so easy to achieve and it allows you to offset your other income with your passive losses. If you phase out, then you will want to explore the power behind being a real estate professional, which is what we're going to be talking about next. So what is a real estate professional? If you qualify as a real estate professional, you are able to offset ordinary income with your rental losses. This allows you to use your full loss, not just limited to $25,000 that we mentioned previously, but you can use your full loss. In order to qualify as a real estate professional, you need to materially participate and then meet two further tests. To be considered a material participation in one activity, you need to meet one of seven tests that the IRS has. And there are two main tests that we see most people target, which are you participated in the activity for more than 500 500 hours, or you participated in the activity for more than 100 hours during the tax year, and you participated more than any other individual. And that includes people who don't own any interest in the rental property. So if you meet the material participation test in one or more activity, you need to then meet the two real estate professional tests. 
And in order to be a real estate professional test, there's there's two that you need to meet. You performed more than 750 hours of service during the tax year in real property trades or businesses in which you materially participated. And then the second one is that more than half of your working hours for the year must be in your real estate in which you materially participated. So one thing to understand with material participation is that it is separate for each activity. However, you do have the option to elect to treat all of your real estate activities as a single activity. And this would be helpful if no single activity meets the $750, 750 hour test for the real estate professional, or if you do not meet the material participation test in the activity that you want to use the losses for. Now, it's important to understand that you must both materially participate and meet the real estate professional test in order to qualify as a real estate professional. So qualifying as a real estate professional can be complex. And there are certain things you need to do to make sure you are documenting everything properly. So just be sure to take this seriously. And if you're making, and you, and you want to make sure that you have everything set up properly. Now, let's kind of do a summary of this to kind of go through and, and look at everything. Uh, remember from previous topics discussed, rental activity is typically going to be a passive activity, which means any losses from rental activity can only uh, offset other passive income, not your ordinary income. But in this blog, we discussed two options where you can use a rental loss to offset other types of income as long as you qualify. So let's go through kind of an example to put this to practice, help it make sense. Let's assume you had W W2 income of $90,000. And then let's assume you had rental losses of $70,000. Now, that big rental loss would be due to high initial depreciation and then, of course, your normal operating expenses. If you actively participate in the rental activity like we talked about previously here, you would be able to take $25,000 of your losses to offset a portion of your $90,000 W-2 income. And the remaining amount of that $70,000 is just going to be carried forward. So that means you would only need to pay taxes on $65,000 of your W-2 income. Note, if you did not actively participate, you wouldn't be able to use the passive losses until you had passive income. Although, you know, kind of as we talked about today, we recommend anybody, as long as they're under that $100,000 income limit or under the 150 where it completely phases out, if you're under those income limits, we recommend everyone take advantage of being an active participant, an active investor, because it's very easy to meet as we discussed. Now, let's say that you qualified as a real estate professional and you materially participated in the activity. You would be able to take the full $70,000 loss against your W-2 income, meaning you would only pay taxes on $20,000. So, you know, as we talked about in previous blogs and podcast episodes, oftentimes real estate in the beginning years will have a positive cash flow, meaning money in your pocket, but show a loss on paper due to high depreciation. Utilizing real estate is a great way to cut your tax bill, but you just need to make sure you're doing it correctly and documenting everything properly. So I just want to go through a summary again of what is an active investor versus what is a real estate professional. Again, an active investor is if you have income below $100,000 um, or below one hundred fifty, dollars where it completely phases off. Your income's under that and you actively participate in managing your rental. Again, this does not mean you, do, you don't need to be very in-depth. You just need to make management decisions, maybe hire your contractors, things like that. But if you actively participate in managing your rental, you can deduct up to $25,000 in real estate losses. And that can be used against other income, including ordinary income. If you're in real estate, we recommend that everybody, as long as you're under that income limitations, be qualified as an active real estate investor. Now, real estate professional is where things get touched up a notch. And this is where you can really cut your tax bill. If you have ordinary income, business income, W-2 income, by being a real estate professional, you can really start to cut in into some of that ordinary income by using real estate losses. And to be a real estate professional, you need to do two things. You need to be you need to material materially participate in the activity and there's a couple tests for that and then you also need to meet the two real estate professional tests. Now, in order to be a material participant, there's kind of two tests that we see most uh, business owners, most uh, taxpayers qualify for if they're if they're going to qualify, and that is number one, you participated in the activity for more than five hundred hours th- throughout the year, or the second one is you participated in the activity for more than a hundred hours, as well as you participated more than any other individual. That includes non-owners, so that's contractors, everything else. So if you meet one of those material participation tests, good. Now you need to meet two 
real estate professional test. And the first one of a real estate professional test is you performed more than 750 hours of services during the tax year in real property trades or businesses in which you materially participated. The second piece is more than half of your working hours for the year must be in your real estate in which you materially participated. So again, this is a great way to be able to offset some of your ordinary income, some of your W-2 income, some of your business income. We see this all the time where people are utilizing real estate to help offset their other income because real estate oftentimes is going to have losses that you can utilize to offset, especially in the beginning years. Now, one cool thing to note about this is that you only need to have one spouse be a real estate professional. So let's say you have one spouse is a business owner, they're, they're running their business, the other spouse is going to be a real estate professional. And because you're married filing jointly, assuming you are, you're going to be able to qualify and be able to utilize the spouse that's a real estate professional and all those losses to offset the spouse that is a business owner or a high income W-2 owner or something like that. So these are two strategies that we want you to be thinking about, especially as you're getting involved in real estate, because it's a great way to help cut that tax bill apart. We see a lot of people eliminate a tax bill in some years by utilizing this real estate professional strategy. The key thing is, is it's very complex. What we talked about is a very simplified version of it. It's complex. Make sure you're doing your homework on this. Make sure you're doing things the right way, setting it up, documenting things properly, documenting your hours to help support this in the event that the IRS comes knocking and just needs some information. Again, this is uh, just one uh, podcast episode in an entire group, and, and we have blog posts on all of this that we're putting together on real estate taxes. So if you have not checked out our other content around real estate taxes, do so now by visiting the Ultimate Guide to Real Estate Taxes. You can find that at taxsavingspodcast.com forward slash real estate. Now, one last thing before we go, we also have a full section in our tax minimization program specific to strategies around rental properties. So as, as you know, our tax minimization program, we do t- go through a lot of different things. We do have a sp- section specific to rental properties. So as part of that, as part of our tax minimization program, you get a library of tax strategies, implementation guides, videos, downloads. We have our free bookkeeping training program, and then we have some other bonuses, which my favorite is the Ask the Pro. You have unlimited access to our team to ask general tax and accounting questions. So kind of think of it like having an accountant in your back pocket. If you have not joined our tax minimization program yet, now is a great time to do it. We are including a promotion right now where you get uh, access to the recordings of our Small Business Tax Savings Summit, all free as part of your membership. So you can go to taxsavingspodcast.com forward slash tax to join our tax minimization program now. That is all I have for today. Come back next week as we continue this discussion on real estate. We're going to be talking about what expenses are available for rental properties. So thanks again for listening to another episode, and I will see you next week. This has been another episode of the Small Business Tax Savings Podcast. If you enjoy our weekly episodes, please leave a review and share with other business owners. You can find previous episodes and more information at www.taxsavingspodcast.com. Thanks for listening and have a great day.